Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope everyone enjoyed the fun industry quiz that we just had earlier. And a reminder to head over to visit the booths. Uh, there are some really cool prizes um, among all the sponsored booths. And the lounge is open 24-7 to continue the conversations and connect with other people. Um, for this session, again, a little reminder to put your questions in the Q&A and don't leave them until the end because Ermit has this really cool function where people can vote questions up. So um, your question can be voted up and, and answered um, live as a, as a kind of priority. My name is Maria, um, a Gala Board of Director, uh, sorry, Board Director. Um, and we kicked off today with a really stimulating presentation about ethical standards for voice and what LSPs can do. And we're going to continue with another um, amazingly thought provoking topic, which is ISO 8000 and whether this might be an important standard for the future of our industry. Our speaker is Marcus Denay. Uh, he's a, a true industry veteran. He's, he has over 24 years experience in the software and localization industries. And at SAP, he's responsible for defining and implementing the strategic direction for the company's language technology. He's also a key driving force behind the GALA Client Special Interest Group and we're very, very grateful for his energy and enthusiasm and for him generously devoting his time as a volunteer to this group over so many years. So My thank pleasure. you, Marcus. My pleasure. Um, something that not a lot of people know is that Marcus really loves the ocean. And when he is uh, by the sea, <laughs> he it, it has a transformational effect on him. And he, he has candidly admitted that he prefers sort of youthful adolescent activities than those perhaps one might consider more appropriate to his age. So he's absolutely thrilled to have a 12-year-old boy as an, a very appropriate and empathetic um, sparring partner. So thank you for sharing <laughs> that with us, Marcus. And without further ado, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Screen. Thank you very much, Maria, for a kind introduction. You've, you've learned a little bit of about my semi-religious relationship to water and ocean and my absolutely great love for my little boy. So I'm trying to be as young as I can. So thanks a lot. Um, so I'm just trying to share my screen now and, and open up this presentation and uh, jump into the into the topic right away before can, can you give me a short a voice that you can see my screen we can't actually at the you moment Marcus. not no. yet no just let me check um just let me see uh, can you see it now we can yes wonderful wonderful so Thanks a lot, first of all, to, to Gala for organizing this event for the program committee selecting me. And I hope to see you soon in person, hopefully next year at the Gala event in, in San Diego. I'm so much looking forward to it and I'm so much hoping to be there. So let me just start right away. Um, could ISO 8000 be an important standard for the future of the language industry? Yeah, I've been thinking about this question for quite some time now. It uh, first came up in the context of some topics I was working on at the time, I thought the standards could be useful for those specific topics. But I quickly realized that the question was actually much larger than those specific topics. If we really want to answer it properly, we need to broaden the scope and address it to the whole language industry. So just let me give you a little personal thought process. So how did this question even come up in the first place? It was quite some time ago as I was struggling with probably the most fundamental problem that the translation industry has, the quality problem, or rather the quality problems, let's take the plural. Our industry has traditionally struggled to describe the positive properties and the value of its work and products. Unlike, for example, the automotive industry where any salesman is easily able to reel off the benefits and attractive properties of the products, we try to systematically control the qualities of our production processes and to integrate our standardized quality matrices, the MQM, the DCF, flexibly into them in the context of our new standards. But it's all, and you've heard it yesterday also from the standardization gurus in our industry, 
uh, from Alan Melby and, and Bill and so on. But it's all very complex. And at the end, the level of perceived quality is still highly subjective. If you try to systematically predict what qualities the product will have while it's still in the production process, it gets even more complicated. And that makes it rather difficult to industrialize those processes, never mind explain them to an outsider in a way they can easily understand. And that's important. The sellers, obviously, in many cases, don't understand. It's a black box. But given, or the buyers, for example, sorry, but given the ever increasing numbers of assets needing to be translated and the ever decreasing numbers of qualified translators globally, industrialize those processes we must. While looking at the topic of process automation, I quickly realized, and I think anyone who has worked on the topic had, has had a similar experience. I realized that it's not really possible to increase the degree of automation if you don't have some kind of automated reliable quality sensor that you can flexibly insert into those parts of the processes where it's needed. And then we started looking at including MT, machine translation to our processes. That didn't make trying to industrialize these processes any easier, especially with respect to systematic quality assurance. Even today, usage of machine translation is not systematically covered by the ISO 9000 series and its derivatives. We have partially automated the human value chain in our industry. And in addition to human services, we can now offer also software services, also as APIs, as part of the process of manufacturing translation products. But we are still avoiding the question of what exactly the positive qualities of our products are or what the, the actual value is that we are creating. The products are, of course, the translated assets themselves, the documentation, the translated user interfaces or pieces of software, and so on and so forth. But these can lose their value over time. Fortunately, the money invested also ends up as multilingual data in databases. These are then reused, exchanged, and processed further, either by people or software, until someone decides then at point X in time, the invested money Y has resulted in acceptable quality Z. So if the multilingual data in our databases de facto represent a tangible asset of our industry, if the data in the database is like money on a bank account, I wondered if an ISO standard for data quality and data management might not help us to de describe the positive characteristics or qualities of our tangible assets directly, rather than taking the indirect route of describing the qualities of processes used to create them through ISO 9000 series and so on and so forth. Don't get me wrong, ISO 9000 series is very important and you will see it. You will see the connection later on. In the early 90s, we started reusing the multilingual data stored in databases on an industrial scale in order to increase productivity, reduce costs, and if everything went to plan, to increase quality. Now, Neural MT and the advantage in machine learning have put a new spin on data reuse, but also brought it to a new level with new challenges. We've landed on Mars, so to speak, in a new digital age. Data is the new oil. Data is the new oil. It's valuable, but if unrefined, it cannot really be used. It has to be changed into gas, plastic, chemicals, etc., to create a valuable entity that drives profitably activity. So data must be broken down, analyzed for it to have value. Data is the new oil, and in our context, refining could mean cleaning or increasing data quality for specific communication purposes. Over the last 30 years, the, trans the language industry has produced huge quantities of high quality data for a wide range of purposes. And productivity can no longer be increased only through reuse scenarios involving translation memories or term databases. Neural machine translation facilitates productivity gains on a whole new scale if, and only if, enough high quality data for different purposes is available. But, and here's a rub, who has enough high quality data for all the different purposes needed in the industry? And we are not just talking about the language industry. The entire digital economy is dependent on the question of how the financial aspects of data sharing in global supply chains can be managed. One thing is clear, the more high quality data you can gather in order to meet a particular goal, 
the better you will be able to train the models for that particular purpose. So what's the fundamental problem? The real issue is that sharing data requires trust. Since the data contains valuable artifacts, that could be intellectual property, information relevant to patents, trade secrets, and that in turn gives rise to the question of who actually owns these valuable artifacts in the global chains of the language industry and how their usage is regulated. We have heard a lot of interesting talks about that during the last one and a half days. The data could also contain legally protected and sensitive personal data, GDPR and so on, which needs to be excluded from the, uh, from the use in machine learning processes. Here then we have the question on how this data can be anonymized or pseudonymized, but still help us to achieve the desired learning outcome in the machine learning models. Now, so how can we create the trust needed for sharing data? Of course, sharing data could simply mean giving data away in the first instance. There might be reasons to do so, but A, you can't give away what you don't, do not own. So you should proceed with caution here. And B, who would do that if they're aware of the value of the data? And by now, many have heard that data is the new oil. Many have invested huge sums in creating the data, and by giving it away, they're potentially robbing themselves of current or future commercial advantages. Sharing data could also mean trading data. So how can I, as a prospective purchaser of data, ensure that it's good enough in terms of both quality and quantity for my purposes? It's a difficult exercise. As a seller or even as a user of data, I might quickly find myself even confronted with liability claims. At least in European law, the liability risk can only be mitigated through a management system. So I'd have to A, be able to document that I'm producing reliably described qualities, and B, to be able to document my efforts to systematically improve those qualities at all times. This shows us clearly the connection between quality management and risk management, a topic which many experienced colleagues in our industry have been driving. I learned about it first time from eBay's keynote at the gala conference in New York, but which hasn't yet been getting the broad attention that I believe it deserves. But okay, let's get back to ISO 8000. It describes how to create a management system for managing data and data quality. Which ISO standards are important and relevant when it comes to data and data quality management? Let's start with the chapters on organizational knowledge in ISO 9001, which states for following. Just let me check and read it out to you. The organization shall determine the knowledge necessary for the operation of the quality management system and its processes and to assure conformity of goods and services and customer satisfaction. It further states that every employee must be aware of the quality management processes, that a quality management system requires documentation and a documentation management system that fulfills certain criteria and so on and so forth. Yeah, a lot of stuff, but here's the root. The structure of knowledge management systems can be represented as follows, as you can see here. Knowledge means, to a certain extent, structure and processes, so linking information. Information, in turn, can be classified as data. This, in turn, can be classified or seen as harmonization of meaning. So here's the core of ISO 8000. The starting point of ISO 8000 is a basic understanding of the relationship between process qualities and data qualities. So data quality target influences the process quality target and vice versa, which is something we're all deeply familiar with. Rubbish in, rubbish out versus the production of high quality, which obviously requires, as all of you know, more complex and higher quality processes, which in turn take more time and money to run. But here's the core, that's the essential relationship. The data and data quality management standard ISO 8000 is practically embedded in the ISO 9000 series. Or rather, the ISO 9000 series creates the framework requirements for ISO 8000. ISO 8000 in turn creates the requirements for how data and data quality need to be described. So the good news is, we are still talking about processes. So still in the context of ISO 9001 and things that you all are very familiar with, with because most of you are already certified. The bad news is now we would need to talk about data and not only to talk about data, we would need to describe and define data and data qualities. 
So for ISO 8000, we would first need to describe or define the data. You can see a high level schema on this slide here. So to define language data and corresponding metadata in the first place, think about it if you're in a purchasing situation, having an assurance that your data is of a quality A, middle or low, that brings you value. If it's metadata rich or not, that is uh, good information for your machine learning system. There are some approaches to do that in the industry, some academical ontological ones, but to the best of my knowledge, none yet that are contractually secure so that you can use in a contract when it comes to uh, negotiating or trading data. But then we also need to assure the quality of the data, since as we all know only too well, often the quality of data created on an industrial scale is not high enough to meet quality goals. Back to our rubbish in, rubbish out example. Quality assurance, however, is a long and expensive process for often questionable benefits. We therefore need to validate which data is really needed for specific purposes, and then set up a continuous quality management process that ensures that quality is not lost and investments are protected. Let's assume that we have now described our multilingual data. Next, we're going to need a selection of quality criteria in order to describe its positive characteristics or qualities. A selection is given on this slide here. And all of you performing quality work on translation memories or term databases are aware of these. It's completeness, reliability, consistency, no duplicates in the data sets, and so on and so forth. So this is easy to understand for all linguistic quality management people. And in order to make the positive characteristics of our data visible and negotiable, we'll need to be able to measure data quality. For that, we'll need suitable methodologies. But that's a topic for another day or workshop. You can see shortly on the slide. Various matrices, standard procedures for data streams, standard procedure data rule sets, rule-based procedures, and last but not least, the sequence of its application in quality management processes related to data. Yeah. So in addition, we'll also need uh, a set of principles that would govern data quality management processes in accordance with ISO 8000. These processes will systematically evaluate and optimize both data quality and process quality related to data and data quality management. In order to achieve an application of the reference model of a data quality management process according to ISO 8000. But here we're quite clearly talking about investment decisions and it's time to pause and ask ourselves, do we think that the technologies of the digital economy, machine learning, AI, and so on we're talking about in the last years are going to be around for long enough that it's going to be worth our while to create this kind of a data quality management system? Leave it up to you to answer this question. Now let's get to my lovely maturity model. <laughs> and let's ask us, what are the other contexts for discussions around data and data quality management? Let's bring it into a broader context. Let's start by gazing at our own collective navels. Where would we put our own data management activities in a CMMI model? We are all familiar with the principles based on the maturity model for the industry, the localization maturity model proposed by Common Sense Advisory, right? So let's give it a try. Oh, sorry. How does the CMMI maturity model apply to data management? You can easily Google it. There are tons of images there with its application. At an initial stage, Data management efforts are informal and ad hoc, obviously done by heroes, done in silos, also all this chaotic stuff. Managed would mean that data management practices are defined and documented processes at a business unit level, so still silos. Defined would mean that data management efforts are aligned with business strategy using standardized and consistently implemented processes across silos, obviously. Measured data is managed as an enterprise asset using governance processes and organizational structures. Optimized data management is a strategic organizational capability. There's a process for systematic improvement. Bad news, we need to reach the last level if we want to mitigate those liability risks I was talking about before, according at least to European law. Let's put this into a bigger picture. Here's an overview of how it fits all together. Like a balanced scorecard, it comes from both directions, both top-down and bottom-up. From bottom 
to the top, you can see here at the bottom, the fundamental data management capabilities. You need databases. You need to be able to manage big volumes of data. You have unstructured, structured data, document and content management systems. A step above, activities become more complex. And here, at least when it comes to data integration or metadata management, also some standardization needs kick in, right? The third step required really sophisticated methodologies to prepare data use for strategic goals. Yeah? But the most difficult one could be the change of culture around data, right? To achieve a defined business or data strategy goal. So convert coordinators, linguists to data quality managers or data quality coordinators. I don't know. What should it, what could it mean? Various impacts. And we have heard a lot of talks before that there are new roles in the industry now. So let's look even beyond the borders of our own company's data and business strategies. Where do we find this discussion of the global context looking beyond the borders? Actually, at the moment, it looks like the different data strategies are giving rise to different digital cultures. Here, you can see the link to the European initiatives, the European Data Strategy, the Data Governance Act, the EU Cybersecurity Act. So the same happens in Russia, in China, in the US. Maybe um, there are different cultures here. And maybe in the future, we might need to translate also between those different digital cultures. I think some of you are already doing this. It's going to be hard work. Things are moving. Things are still in a very dynamic mode. But this also might bring our industry really a greater significance and a value. Now. So it's going to be important for us to understand how data sharing works in the new digital economies, and especially to understand the legal impact on supply chains. You see here the German Lieferkettengesetz, the supply chain law, the ethical standards that are now going to be implemented. And recently, Google, Microsoft, SAP, a lot of uh, companies have signed human rights in the cloud, and, and it has all to do with this um, data sharing ideas here. And I don't just mean that in terms of extending contractual arrangement in supply chains, but above all in terms of how fair trade in data level supply chains can protect the interest of every participant, even the most vulnerable. In our industry, I think that would be the freelancer, right? One thing is clear, the better we can describe the positive characteristics, the value of our data products, and the more successfully we can share this in data supply chains, the fairer the pricing and the distribution of profits will be. See Gaia X. You see here the, the, the European um, data platform. It just takes care about federation services, identity trust, sovereign data exchange, compliance. On It builds on an infrastructure ecosystem. That's not proprietary development. The proprietary development is here. And on top, we have a data, data ecosystem. And how the IDS framework helps to maybe facilitate data sharing on a technical level. So the interaction of Gaia-X and IDS has the three main tasks here, as you can see, self-sovereign data storage, trustworthy data usage, and interoperable data exchange, right? One work in progress from the automotive industry is Catena-X, what you can see here, which creates the legal and technical framework for all data stakeholders in a supply chain to have fair access to data pooling. And I really love this picture here. So you can see here the control freaks, the, the data silos stop here, the old work, the data puddles, and here the pioneer, the shouters, the mind shift that we need to get. And here's the data pooling, a fair data access for all the stakeholders in the digital supply chain. And here are the people who build the bridge. And actually, to be a pioneer is a hell of a job. That's true. Now, back to our original questions. Could ISO 8000 be an important standard for the future of the language industry? I hope I've given you some insights into why I find this question so fascinating. Now I'd like to get your reaction and feedback. What do you think? Is it a question that we should or could be discussing more deeply within our industry? Thanks a lot for your time, your interest and your attention. Thank you very, very much, Marcus. That was fascinating. Um, Again, since the very first time we started uh, talking about this, I, it, it blew my mind because it's something that I think uh, 
very few people in the industry has even considered. And certainly the maturity model applied to data management, I personally view it as kind of the next frontier or the new frontier. So before we move on to Q&A, and I know we have a few questions um, for you, we're going to take a look um, at the illustration that Pete, our visual artist, has been working away in the background. So we'll pin the illustration and we'll show everybody. It's uh, impressive. Really I impressive. really love it. It's so super. They I, can, I can get that, right? <laughs> absolutely. They're, they're um, absolutely wonderful takeaways uh, wonderful and and certainly things that can be used then to to kind of represent a point as a, as a summary but in a very visual manner so absolutely love it thank you pete thank you very very much so we're going to move over to our questions and um, i think we have a couple of questions we'll pull them up on screen uh, jessica if you could yeah do that for us uh, we'll start maybe with the one at the top is do we even have an agreed no it, it doesn't matter we can start with either <laughs> in general is the approach to data governance standards driven by governments or lawyers or corporations and can our industry truly play a role i would think that our industry but that's my personal opinion here can play a role because actually the governance or the lawyers, they would uh, respond uh, to business requirements and who should uh, be able to define the business requirements of our industry, if not we, the stakeholders of our industry. Okay. So I, I know that, for example, the big software companies try to, you know, address their interests to the, to the, to the governments they try to explain them what their business needs are. And I think uh, also the governments and the lawyers need to reflect what uh, is the, uh, are the demands of the stakeholders. Otherwise, the business cannot, you know, cannot run. And uh, that is in nobody's interest, I guess. Very good points, absolutely. And we have another question. Thank you. Um, do we even have no. an agreed upon definition of language data? <laughs> no, I've, I've yes. read. I've read. I've read actually some, some, some definitions. If you try to Google it, there are some definitions of the, uh, of the German Institute of Artificial Intelligence or Felix uh, Sasaki, Sasaki um, ontological ones. But I think that's the first thing that we need to agree on. So what is a primary data and what is metadata? And there are some really uh, dynamics in that data and metadata. A metadata, uh, like a synonym, could be a, a primary data in another context. So it's a, very, it's a very complex and dynamic thing to break it up. But I think that's the starting point. I think we should agree upon, uh, on, a on a definition of multilingual data, of language data, which is also uh, which we can also use in contracts when it comes to trading data. I think that is something really needed. I've uh, we had to invent it ourselves. I have not. I had no reference when we started to to think about it in in our specific use cases, and I think it would be a great idea to to look at this together. It's an agreement. Thank you, Marcus. Yes, and. I sense a special interest group coming up on yeah, this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I would, I would, I would hope so. I would hope so. That's maybe if if people find valuable, also the stakeholders in our industry find it valuable to discuss this. There are so many touch points. I mean, and nobody can teach you how to apply an ISO 8000 standard to your own, uh, to your own, let's say, um, circumstances or to your own company, but. There are so many things that we need to agree upon in common. There are so many conventions we can uh, agree on together and we can drive together so that I th see a lot of touch point for a discussion here. And I would really appreciate it. Absolutely. So we'll have plenty of opportunity to discuss more later on in the lounge uh, over networking. And certainly, yes, I think the, the an SIG, a special interest group on this sounds fantastic. And um, I guess just one final question for me in terms of as you know, as language service providers, where what what could be next? What might be next um, if somebody wants to kind of embark on this? Is it a maturity, looking at their maturity level at this stage and kind of making some um, steps, take some steps forward or? I think I think it's not about the bureaucracy and all the certification. I mean, maybe we need the certification uh, at the end of the day. I think trading of data might need some certification of data so that you can trust the other. 
but I think uh, on, a, on, a, on a company level, it's, uh, the, it's, it's being on the road. I think the starting this um, reflection in a, in a start to build up thinking about a management system for data and data quality management is a super important exercise for, for a company who wants to move in this direction and define a data strategy, combine it with its business goals. So I think that's the first thing. And I think the important stuff is not the bureaucracy, is not that you're ISO certified, but being on the road, thinking about it, because I think it's a longer process. It, um, it requires a lot of cultural change and cultural change management. And this is, as we all know, the most difficult thing to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Fascinating. Thank you again. Thank you so Thank much, you very Marcus, much for, your time for raising time. our awareness. It was certainly the first time I hold up my hand. I had heard about ISO 8000 in the context of our industry. Um, we're, we have a break now. So uh, thanks again, Marcus. Thank you, Pete, for the beautiful illustration. And everybody enjoy the break and see you in a few minutes again. Thank Take you very much, Maria. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Bye. Bye.